reading this evening from the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 6. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and reading into chapter 7. Let's share the word of God. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust uh, destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness! No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not the life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? 
Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Judge not, that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. For what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us tonight. Let's read that closing section of Matthew chapter 7 from verse 13, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds beat, blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. We've been thinking for some weeks about Jesus and his words. 
And uh, tonight we'll draw that to a close with this passage. It's not too difficult to imagine that preachers are often tempted to end their sermons uh, with an upbeat, positive application. Something intended to sort of lift the congregation and to keep them going through another week and so on. That's why you might be surprised by the way in which the Lord Jesus ends his Sermon on the Mount. In fact, some people find it a little bit disturbing to get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, only to find this extended, solemn and serious appeal and application of his teaching. And he's so solemn in doing this because he's dealing with matters that are so serious. You'll notice that several times he raises the issue of our destiny and our judgment. In verse 13 and 14, he speaks of destruction versus life. In verse 19, he speaks of a tree being cut down and cast into the fire. In verse 23, of his rejection of many on the day of judgment. Verse 24, of a house, our lives, collapsing. And so serious is this issue of our ultimate end, our final Destin, our final destiny and as we're so susceptible to being deceived as to whether we truly are disciples of the Lord Jesus and subjects of his kingdom that Jesus presses these issues on us with such urgency at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So this isn't a comfortable way to end a sermon. It leads, leaves hearers feeling distinctly uneasy and uncomfortable. And there are many teachers of homiletics in theological colleges of preaching who would counsel against ending a sermon as Jesus does here. But this is what Jesus said and we are to take the time to listen to what many would say Jesus should never have said. So how does Jesus apply his teaching to his disciples? What does he press upon these people who have sat and listened or stood and listened to this Sermon on the Mount, of which we've just read a portion this evening. Well, in the first place, he confronts us with the way that we must follow. Verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The way we must follow. Notice how candid Jesus is. He never holds back saying what we need to know. He never deceives. He's always straightforward, isn't he, in the things that he says. Now this is going to be tough. In effect, he's saying, notice that he doesn't pitch any false promises. He doesn't make any fake appeals to us. He doesn't tell you what a wonderful and exciting thing it's going to be to live the Christian life. He, he doesn't say... I've got a wonderful plan for you. He doesn't say that. I want you to join me on this great adventure of life. There may be some truth in those statements, but that isn't what Jesus says. He says the gate is narrow. He says the way is difficult. And he doesn't call us to admire the gate or the way or even to consider the gate and to consider the way he says, enter it. Enter it. It's a command and it's a call to enter the way. And it's important to see here that Jesus doesn't only speak about the entrance and the gate, but he speaks about the way. There is a way that must be followed, a pilgrimage, a road that is narrow and confined and difficult. He says it's difficult, doesn't he, there? In fact, the word that he uses in verse 14 that's translated difficult is a word which at its root means affliction. It means something that presses in on someone, restricts them, brings them under pressure, brings them into bondage, bound up and tight. And it seems then that Jesus intends that we should see what Paul and Barnabas, you remember, told those Christians in Acts 14, that it is through much tribulation that you enter the kingdom of heaven. 
He's telling us that if we enter through the narrow, narrow gate, we are going to enter into a path, into a way of life that is constrained and in which we will feel, feel and experience many afflictions and sufferings and distresses. He doesn't hide that from us. And, a part, and part of the difficulty of the way is its sheer unpopularity. Did you notice that? Because there is another way, a far more popular way. There is a wide gate, he says, and there's a broad way, and there are many who go in by that way. But you see, he's never called us to be part of a great herd. He's called us to be part of a little flock. Disciples of the Lord Jesus go in by the narrow gate. But that isn't the popular thing to do. That is to go against the flow and the run of things. It cuts against the grain to go in by this way. And yet we live in a culture where it seems everybody is saying to everybody else all of the time, just go with the flow. Why make life difficult for yourself? Jesus says, no, you've got to go against the flow. You've got to cut against the grain. It's a difficult way, and for that reason, it's not the popular way. And Jesus wants you to know that right at the start. But that's the way that must be followed. And it doesn't matter what your vocation is in life, what your particular circumstances are. If you are a Christian, if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ you're going to meet this along the way. There's no escaping it. And as a Christian, very regularly you find you're going to have to make decisions in life. And you know from the get-go it's going to make people unhappy. And people are going to be displeased with that decision. And there are going to be people who will wish you didn't have to say what you've got to say to them. And you wish you wouldn't have to say it to them. Sometimes you've got to take the unpopular way. Frequently you find yourself confronted by that reality in the Christian life. Jesus doesn't hide it from us. And he stresses as well the vigilance that he calls us all to. You see that in verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, who inwardly they are ravenous wolves, he says. He's warning disciples against false teachers. And the trouble with false teachers, of course, is that they're so subtle. You can't tell them from their manner. You can't tell them from their appearance. They may seem and they may sound as spiritual, even as godly as it's possible to be. That's how false teachers very often come across. It seems they have an authority. It seems they have a certainty about the way they speak to other people and so on. And when you look at them, they look as though they're part of the flock. They look as though they've come in through the narrow gate and are on the narrow way. And that can be then very difficult to detect. Back in um, 1943, the, the British had devised a way of effectively jamming German radar. So the Luftwaffe had to use radio to send instructions to their pilots on bombing missions and fighter pilots. But the British had also set up a powerful transmitter and they had recruited a team of very fluent German speakers. And they were sending out then conflicting orders to the German pilots as they were flying towards Great Britain. And their German was so good that it couldn't be distinguished from the actual controllers back in Germany. And the stories told how on one occasion during a raid uh, on, uh, over Germany, the German controllers were saying to their pilots, beware of ghost voices, meaning the British controllers who were trying to deceive them and give them different instructions. So the German, the German controllers were saying, beware of ghost voices, beware of being led astray by the enemy. And later on in the heat of the battle, one German controller was so frustrated by these conflicting orders that he started to swear. And out came a whole burst of profanity. And the British controller, speaking in fluent German, said, the Englishman is swearing. And the German controller said, it's not the Englishman, it's me. And there was total confusion then. 
uh, resulted from it. They didn't know who to obey because they all sounded the same. Well, the Lord Jesus is describing a similar situation to that here. False prophets, false teachers, he said, who will come your way. Who are you going to meet in the Christian life? And how are you going to know? How will you tell them apart from the true and the genuine? And he says that you can't tell it merely by the manner. You have to know how to discern and how to judge them. So he gives us the various criterion in verse 16 and 20. You will know them, he says, by their fruit. And he unfolds a principle for us, and it's essentially this. The fruit of a life will disclose the character. Over time, the fruit invariably and infallibly discloses the character of that life. In verse 17 and 18, the Lord Jesus says, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. That is, from the fruit that the tree produces, you can determine whether that tree is healthy and sound and good or defective. The fruit gives evidence of the inner condition of the tree. Thomas Boston, uh, in one of his sermons, writes of wintertime, when trees are stripped of leaves and they're all bare, and he says, all the trees look very similar. They all look dead. But when springtime comes, buds and leaves begin to grow on those branches and it becomes evident which trees are alive and which are not. There's evidence, there's proof. Jesus is saying, be vigilant now. You watch out for that. Teachers have to be judged by their fruit. But what fruit do you look for? That's a question then, isn't it? One obvious question is, what are these people teaching me? One question to ask any teacher is, who is Jesus Christ? What do you say about Jesus? And if they hedge a little bit about that, you've got to press them on that question. You've got to say, is he indeed, as John 1 tells us, God in human flesh? Do you teach that? And many false teachers are exposed by that very basic, obvious question. Or they might come to, come to you and knock your door and say, we are very concerned about family and family values. We want everyone to feel as though they have a home, that there's someone there for them and so on. Who's going to disagree with a message like that? But what is their view of God? Do they think that God has a body like you and I have? Do they think that God took Mary as a wife and produced offspring and that Jesus was the offspring of that union and came into being that way that he had a, a brother called Lucifer? That's what the Mormon church teaches, you see. That's their mythology. So you have to get behind the thing that they first present to you, the sort of headline teaching about family and so on, the far more basic questions. What is God like? Who is Jesus Christ? You have to find out that what people are teaching you lines up with Scripture. Another test is to ask, does this person's teaching produce strife and confusion? Now, you've got to be careful of that question because obviously the truth can really upset people as well. But the truth itself uh, is something that unites the people of God. Truth can arouse all kinds of opposition to itself, but it will unite the people of God. And it's often the case that when false teaching comes amongst the people of God, it causes disturbance and strife and confusion. And when such strife is engendered amongst the people of God, it is often a sign that you are listening and you are dealing with a false teacher. Another sign of false teaching is what we might call servitude. I mean by that that you can come across teaching and you can come across teachers and they, they come to a certain point in their teaching, and the teaching may sound okay. 
but they get to a certain point in teaching where they demand of you a certain loyalty toward themselves. And they look upon you as being unfaithful and disloyal if somehow you fail to, to render to them your devotion and your loyalty to them personally. Watch out for that. For anyone who tries to steal your devotion, who, who to all intents and purposes try to put themselves in the place of Christ, that's a false teacher. And you need to recognise that for what it really is. And then there's the whole issue of sexual morality, or what we might say is sexual immorality. 2 Peter chapter 2 tells us one of the marks of false teachers, not always, but often, is that their lives are marked by sexual immorality. Now, there have been many men, we say to our grief, who have been true teachers who have fallen in such a way. That does not mean they must be false teachers. But in various kinds of false teaching, and amongst false teachers, they integrate into their false teaching justification for sexual immorality. They seem to weave it into their teaching. That's another thing to watch out for. And then there's the whole issue of covetousness and greed. They want your money. And again, I'm not saying that any appeals for funds is the mark and indicator of a false teacher. But when you have a teacher who seems very, very concerned to have your money off you, to receive your gifts, usually that's a sure sign that you are dealing with a false teacher. Because they're marked very often by greed and covetousness. Those are just some of the marks to be watching for. By their fruits you shall know them, says Jesus, so be vigilant. And the people, you see, who are most susceptible to false teachers, who do you think those people are? Well, they're going to be nominal Christians. People with church connections but who have never really taken the time to immerse themselves in the gospel, who have never really for themselves studied the word of God, and as a result, they're ones who are most frequently misled, led astray by false teachers because they just can't tell the difference, because they never really had a solid grasp of the truth. So beware, says Jesus, be vigilant. And you must be vigilant, why? Because the stakes are so high. The outcome is going to be destruction or life. That's why. And then he puts before us the shock we must face. The way we follow, the vigilance we exercise, the shock we face. Verses 21 to 23, Jesus says a very shocking thing, a surprising thing. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, Lord. Isn't that the language of evangelical Christians? Lord, that's the language of evangelical devotion. Now as you read these words, you can be liable to assume that Jesus is making a distinction here between people who are merely mouthing words of commitment to Jesus. They're saying Lord, but there's no real commitment uh, that he's making a distinction then between those who mouth devotion but, and then those who do the Father's will. The contrast between the mouth and the action, words and life. That's not the real distinction he's making though, is it? In verse 22 he says, Many will say to me in that day. Note, notice what he assumes about himself in saying that. They will say to me, 
in that day. He's assuming himself to be the judge of men and women in the last day, in the day of judgment. You see, you don't always have to have an overt statement or claim or, or of, of authority on the part of Jesus for it to be so. Sometimes they're quite incidental statement. Many will say to me in that day, what does that mean? It means Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead, to quote uh, Acts 17, verse 31. Sometimes Jesus simply assumes those things in these almost throwaway statements. Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Now, notice what these people in verse 22 say. They had something that they did. It wasn't merely that they are em they're mouthing empty, shallow professions. That's not what's going on. They prophesied, they did many marvellous works, and they did it in the name of Jesus. So these people had a successful ministry. Yet they had no part in Christ. Isn't that a terrifying and a shocking thing? Isn't that disturbing? Clearly something in them was phony in spite of all that they were saying and in spite of all that they were doing and Jesus says many are deceived that way many will say to me in that day Lord, Lord did we not preach sermons in your name and lead Bible studies and teach Sunday school in your name didn't I serve as a church officer in your name and he will confess. You see, isn't there a danger that uh, we may place our confidence in our own Christian service? Isn't that a danger? And Jesus says that just won't do. That's not enough. That's never going to be enough. And he tells us what is his concern. It is not that we use evangelical language and say to him Lord Lord but rather that we do the will of his father and what's the will of the father what is that what well, is what Jesus has been talking about in this Sermon on the Mount from the beginning of chapter 5 and through the rest of the chapter to this point the one who does the will of the father Jesus would say is the person who casts out his anger and his lust. He's someone who lives in sexual purity. He's someone who is just straightforward in telling the truth. It's not important that he performs miraculous powers and works in the Father's name, but rather that he perform the real miracle of likeness to his Heavenly Father. The one who does the will of the Father is the one for, for whom Doing what pleases the Father is the passion of his life. Whether that is in the way he gives, in the way he prays, in the way he fasts, in the way he repents, that's the one who does the will of the Father. The chief aim, aim that they have in all their life is to please the Heavenly Father. There's no concern in such a person to tell others about what they're doing. What matters is that the Father, who sees in secret, knows about these things. He's the one who says, My Father feeds the bird and clothes the flowers. I trust him to do exactly the same with all of my needs. You see, it's not some outstanding of, uh, record of Christian service that matters. That counts for nothing. Rather, it's the graces that the Lord Jesus speaks of here throughout this sermon, that those graces be seen in us. That's what matters. And we have to be careful then not to be deceived at this point. And as we, as we look at this text, we need to see that familiarity with the Lord Jesus, familiarity with the things of God, knowledge about these things, that is not enough for us. 
association with, with Jesus doesn't amount to eternal life. Mere familiarity with him doesn't bring about acceptance with God. Jesus says, many of these may claim that they have done many mighty works in his name, but that someone performs what others might think are miracles doesn't mean they're disciples of Jesus. If someone were to come in here tonight and somehow open the eyes of someone blind and to do so in Jesus' name, that isn't enough to authenticate their claim to be disciples of Jesus. You can't accept that as the proof and the evidence. 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation chapter 13 tells us, Antichrist himself will perform miracles. He isn't in Christ's kingdom. Mighty works, successful Christian ministries do not validate a claim to be a genuine disciple of Jesus. And so you have to be careful. You have to be careful to do the will of your Father in heaven. Mundane, boring, everyday obedience. That's what matters. Day-to-day -day obedience to the Father's will. That's what counts. Not some outstanding achievement, but doing every day the Father's will. That's what you have to be careful about. And then Jesus speaks lastly about the obedience we must render. You see that in verse 24 through 27. Because we are so susceptible to being deceived. Jesus underlines for us again just how important it is that we hear his words and that we do what he says. That's the test. That's the mark of a true Christian disciple. Hearing his word, verse 24, and doing it. Doing it. Jesus says the person who does that is like someone who builds his house upon a rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The whole thing gets swept away. Jesus is saying then that the person who builds his or her life upon hearing his words and doing what Jesus says, will find that their life is secure in the storm. Whether that be the storm of the final judgment or any of the multitude of storms that we may face along the way, they enjoy this security and this stability. But why does Jesus place such importance on hearing and doing his words? Why are his words... Why is his teaching so important and so vital to him, as we've seen? Well, it's because what you do with Jesus' words, your obedience to his words, reveals your attitude to Jesus himself. And what you do with Jesus' words reveals so much about where you are in terms of discipleship to Jesus. That's why it's so important. Notice that Jesus does not say that if you hear his words and if you do his words, there'll be no floods. He doesn't say there'll be no wind, no rain to contend with, no storms. He doesn't say, hear and do my words, I'll give you a house. Five bedrooms, three bathrooms, double garage, all the mod cons. He doesn't say that. No, he says, you'll go through the storms and the storms will be so severe that sometimes you will think your house is going to collapse. But when you come out the other side, you'll find that your house is still standing. That's an encouragement, isn't it? to Christian discipleship, to following Jesus. And you might think, well, well, it's not much, is it? I'd much rather not go through the storms, thank you very much. But storms there will be, and storms there must be. And the longer I go on in the Christian life, and the more Christians I know, 
And the more I know of their ex experiences in life and of life, all of its challenges and all of the difficulties that will come our way, the more I appreciate how amazing it is that when the Lord Jesus leads us through such storms, we emerge the other side and we are still standing and our lives have not collapsed as we might have expected them to. That's the stability you can have as a disciple of Jesus. We saw some weeks ago, didn't we? Heaven and earth will pass away. My words, says Jesus, will never pass away. And if your life is built on Jesus and his words, not only will his words not pass away, but you won't pass away either. You will not fall. You will not be destroyed. We read in verse 28, And so it was when Jesus ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. You know, you and I need to watch out for our reaction to Jesus and his words. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this wicked and adulterous generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory with all the holy angels. If you will not acknowledge me now, says Jesus, then I will not acknowledge you. When I come in that great day, your reaction to Jesus' words is, is of eternal consequence, in other words. And we see here in verse 28, it's not enough to stand with a crowd and to listen to Jesus' words. That is not enough. It's not enough, like them, even to be astonished by what Jesus says. There's nothing wrong with that, but that can be a very dangerous place to put yourself in. The story's told of... Uh, Admiral Horatio Nelson, he was famed for his courtesy to defeated enemies. And the story is told of how he vanquished one captain in a sea battle and afterwards the French captain approached him with his hand held out as if to shake Nelson's hand. Nelson would not extend his hand. He said, your sword first, then your hand you may be struck by Jesus' words. You may be astonished and astounded by Jesus' words. You may be even admiring what Jesus says. But that counts for nothing. Not really. Your sword first, then your hand. There must be submission to Jesus there must be submission to his authority. And then he will extend his hand to you. Do you just admire Jesus' authority? Or have you bowed for, to him? That makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference today. It will make all the difference in that day. The Lord bless his word to us. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you again for the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, for their power and their authority. We pray that you would deliver us from merely admiring those words and being astonished at their authority, but grant that they would be so deeply impressed upon us that in all our lives and in every aspect and department of life, we would be bowing the knee to him, hearing and doing his will, doing those things that please our Father in heaven. We ask it for your namesake. Amen.